Hello and welcome to the 26th episode of Karl Marx's 18th premiere of Louis Napoleon Reading Group series. Today is Sunday the 11th of April 2021 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. We continue our reading of the Spellbinding final chapter. This week I have the new patrons Philip Nyman, Alexander Burns and the returning Electrician Apprentice to thank. If you like the sound of extra patron-only episodes or joining the new patrons Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution reading group, why not head on over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollars. Your continued support helps me keep the episodes flowing and food in my starving child's belly. If you'd like to take part in the reading group but you're afraid you've missed the first few sessions, on Patreon you can find a link to all the edited audio for the previous sessions, so you can catch up in double quick time. Okay, let's hit it. Okay, let's let's read one more section here before we go off for tonight. Let me see now. Uh, where we go? Oh fuck, that's a long one. Okay, okay I can do see. it. Yeah. Okay. Now, no run, no rushing through there, Derek. All right. Your best teacher voice. But under the absolute monarchy during the first revolution and under Napoleon, the bureaucracy was the only only the means of preparing the class rule of the bourgeoisie. Under the Restoration, under Louis Philippe, under the Parliamentary Republic, it was the instrument of the ruling class, however much it strove for the power of its own. Only under the Second Bonaparte does the state seem to have made itself completely independent. The state machinery has so strengthened itself vis-a-vis civil society that the chief of the Society of December 10th suffices for its head. An adventurer dropped in from abroad, raised on the shoulders of a drunken soldiery, which he brought with whiskey and sausages, and to which he would keep throwing more sausages. Hence, the low-spirited despair, the feeling of monstrous humiliation and degradation that oppresses the breasts of France and makes her gasp. She feels dishonored. And yet, the state power is not suspended in the air. Bonaparte presented a class and the most numerous class of French society at that, the small holding peasants. Just as the Bourbons were the dynasty of the big landed property and the Orleans, Orleans, whatever, the dynasty of money, so the Bonapartes are the dynasty of the peasant, that is, the French masses. The chosen of the peasantry is not the Bonaparte who submitted to the bourgeois parliament, but the Bonaparte who dismissed the bourgeois parliament. For three years, the towns have succeeded in falsifying the means of the December 10th election and in cheating the peasants out of the restoration of the empire. The election of December 10th, 1848, had been consummated only by the coup d'etat of December 2nd, 1851. The small holding peasants form an enormous mass whose members live in a similar condition, but without entering into the manifold relations with each other. Their mode of production isolates them from one another instead of bringing them into mutual intercourse. The isolation is furthered by France's poor means of communication and the poverty of the peasants. Their fields of production, the small holdings, permits no division of labor in its cultivation, no application of science, and therefore no multifariousness of development, no diversity of talent, no wealth of social relationships. Each individual peasant family is almost self-sufficient, directly produces most of its consumer needs, and thus acquires its means of life more through an exchange with nature than with intercourse with society. A small holding... The peasant and his family, besides its other small holdings, another peasant and another family. A few more scores of these constitute a village, and a few of the villages constitute a department. Thus, the great mass of the French nation is formed by the simple addition of of homologous magnitudes, much as potatoes in a sack form a sack of potatoes. In so far as millions of families live under the conditions of existence that separate their mode of life, their interests, and their culture, from that of the other classes and put them in hostile opposition to the latter, they form a class. And so far as they are merely a local interconnection among these small holding peasants and the identity of their interests forms no community, no national bond, nor political organization among them, they do not constitute a class. They are therefore incapable of asserting their class interests in their own name, whether through parliament or a convention, and they cannot represent themselves, they must be represented. Their representatives must be at the same time appear as their master, as an authority over them, an unlimited government power which protects them from the other classes and sends them rain and sunshine from above. 
The political influence of the small holding peasants, therefore, finds its final expression in the executive power which subordinates society to itself. And this hits me like a core because it actually, we don't have peasants anymore, but we have a lot of classes or adjacent classes in the United States that operate like this. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Let's just, there's a bit yeah. here. Uh, let's, let's just read these two sentences together just to make it explicit, right? Insofar as millions of families live under conditions of existence that separate their mode of life, their interests and their culture from those of the other classes and put them in a hostile opposition to the latter, they form a class. Insofar as there is merely a local interconnection among these small holding peasants and the identity of their interests forms no community, no national bond and no political organization among them, they do not constitute a class, you know. Like, look at today in America. There's a prolet the, the pro that describes the proletarians. Yeah, it does. So that's that's kind of the deal, right? Is that this is a a, a, um, a theory of class formation that is highly highly dependent on being able to identify and articulate your interests. Well, I mean, um, it's not just that. Like, I, I was talking to my co-author um, Shalom Van Tyne and. She pointed me out that Marx actually explicitly has two different notions of what class is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. This is this is the more like how and that they they you, overlap. Like yeah, so like this is class for itself kind of definition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As class in itself, class for itself. Right. right. And and she was pointing out that most Marxists go willy nilly in between the two, depending on what they want to do, as if one is actually the same thing as the other. Right. Like, Right, but they, they both exist in Marx. Like Marx both has a sociological and a political explanation for what a class does. What mm. worries me about now we talk about the working class in America is 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 there a chance that after industrialization and the in, and the enfranchise and the franchisation of of a large section of the working class into smaller and smaller bodies like like franchises? Um, is the is the alienation of the working class in the developed world actually somewhat similar to that of the of the small land holding peasant? Right, because well, um, when he calls the peasantry a sack of potatoes, which you often hear trotted out as, yeah, Marx thought the peasantry was a fucking sack of potatoes. He's like, fuck them. But the the point, I mean, and it's no doubt derogatory, but the point here is that they are they are atomized. Atomized. atomized yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, they're not they're not actually in intercourse with each other. And I don't know about you, but recently things have seemed pretty atomized recently, eh? But that's only really an intensification of trends that have been yep. going on for decades and decades and decades. But the question then becomes like if if the working class, the proletariat is becoming atomized as the peasantry, as the peasantry was in a process of being uh, swept up into the dustbin of history and replaced by the proletarians. What's replacing the proletarians? Uh, right? The communards, <laughs> the communists. <laughs> uh, yeah. the robot. <laughs> I mean, kind of, kind of robots, kind of like some kind of, I don't know, Huckleberry Finn. Well, but, thing. but here's the, the thing. thing. The, the peasants were also atomized like this for thousands of years. Yes. Like that's, what <laughs> that's what yeah. I'm going to say is, 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 Going from the going from the stable form to the unstable form, and then the unstable form to the stable form doesn't mean that the second stable form isn't stable, right? That atomization could be could be perpetuated. But yeah. like, let's let's look at Marx's explanation for why they are a sack of potatoes, right? Like, so they form an enormous mass who live in similar conditions, but without entering into manifold relations with each other. Okay, like that's more or less true of proletarians these days. Like, you know, not in a, yeah, you know, like they no. enter into economic relations with each other, but not manifold ones. Uh, their mode of production isolates them from one another instead of bringing them into mutual intercourse. And it's not really explained why, but it's it's easy enough to understand what Marx is getting at because, like, oh, yeah, you have a family farm. It's a plot of land. You work the family farm. You're mostly eating your own food that you produce. Uh, and that perpetuates isolation. We do need to think about, like, what about the modern proletarian mode of production would produce the same 
consequences because the second thing that Marx brings up, this isolate, the isolation is furthered by France's poor means of communication and the poverty of the peasants. Uh, that's well, not true, yeah. That's not true. Like, we yeah, absolutely yeah. do not have poor means of communication. Um, in fact, we might have and, too much. <laughs> yeah, like, the moves, means of communication are, like, you know, as manifold as you could fucking ask for. Uh, right. And the poverty of the workers, well, yeah, okay, you know, that's that's certainly, the immiseration is real. Um, but maybe, like, probably not to quite the same degree as the peasantry. Um, furthermore, so he goes, their field of production, the small holding, permits no division of labor in its cultivation, no application of science, and therefore no multifariousness of development, no diversity of talent, no wealth of social relationships. Like, except for that last bit, that's certainly not true today. I right? actually the disagree with you. I, but, but, the yeah, division it, of labor is, has actually been just like negated by automation. I, I well, I, if you work in the service sector, the automation has divided labor so much that you actually do work most parts of this of a job. But it's also because the other the uh, the division of labor is also done by different companies, which you do not interact. So it exists. But you, it has been it has been chunked out to the point that you don't. Ha that's no longer an interface for most people. Okay, I think I, that's I, I think, the, that's the Kyle, crucial point. That's um, the crucial point there, right? But, is I, that that's the but, but, gap that allows the atomization? I think there's but, two but different. Is, isn't isn't um, uh, this uh, precisely Marxist point um, in the Communist Manifesto? You know, with where where where, where they talk about. Um, uh, why the proletarian class is is the only revolutionary class um, is precisely because um, it, you know uh, capitalism has provided means of communication uh, through to the proletarian class. Uh, proletarians can now uh, you know uh, read read literature. Uh, they can they can get education. They are in. They are part of of a social um, mode of production instead of a um, a, a, a parcelated, isolated, atomized mode of production like the peasants are. Like, right. So I think that's that, isn't that, that part threat. of part of the argument. Yeah, but there. But if you look at where where the proletarians get their education from, and so much that they get it, they get it from the state. Um, that it's an incredibly hostile. It's now an incredibly hostile education. It seems irrelevant to them, so it doesn't. It doesn't form a lot of strong social bonds. What? What you? I, I, mean, I, I hate to be like a like almost a proponent of capital decadence theory, but like there is a real sense in which in which the division of labor has gotten so good it's fallen back on itself, and the socialization functions and and education increases that we saw across the board. In the developed world, is stopping and slowing down. Like that's a fact. Like the developed world saw the end of the Flynn effect. Yeah, yeah, so, but but that's that's not what Marx is getting at in in the Communist Manifesto. Well, I think also so the, 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 point, the point the point he's getting, getting at is developing this thread. Yeah, uh, the idea of the working class getting like more and more smart and well read and literate and educated is completely stopped up by. Um, and, and kind of disproven by what Derek is saying. And so I think Derek is actually kind of right here. Like, yeah, but, it, yeah. But, it, but, it, but his point is not that the working class is, is, is getting smarter. The, the point is that the, cap, that the bourgeoisie has provided the working class with means of communication, which is true. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking to each other right now. Um, it has provided the working class with, um, with literacy, uh, and with education and so on, it's not that that the working class is getting smarter. It's that uh, the, the the proletariat does not any, have any use for the bourgeoisie anymore. So, like, if we had a socialist revolution tomorrow, right, uh, and a capitalist, go, you know, comes and asks, well, who will, you know, who will run the nuclear power plants? Who will uh, who will run the machines? The, the proletariat can just answer, well, we already are running those machines. We Except know how to can't. work this stuff. Except they can't. They actually cannot do it. You cannot have the proletariat as any member of the proletariat actually explain how 
the nuclear power plant works. They are, that That is carteled off by opportunity hoarding. This is what actually led to, I mean, there's a reason why the, the, the frustrated revisionist Marxist became the people who uh, became the people who came up with managerial theory because they're like, well, there's this other cat, almost a cast, not a class of people within the proletariat itself and adjacent communities as hoarding this information so that the proletariat cannot use it for itself. And they, and they start coming up with theories as to why. I mean, that's a lot of Pareto's obsession. But they started off as Marxists because they were trying to explain that very problem. Because I you think, can't give any... I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I think a lot that's, of that's, over, that's, that's right? overrated. Yeah, I don't think that's... Like, you go look at, say, computer programmers. Like, they may be well-paid proles, but they're still proles. Like, uh, you know, I, I don't go for that idea that, like, you know, most of the best software is not done by these, like, really high up people. They're mostly done by fellas in their 20s who are pros. That's just the reality of it. Yeah, 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 yeah. you were talking or, about or a field that actually whatever, exi- but... that also exists and doesn't produce... Never mind. Like, no, but he, you, you, mean, you, you actually appeal to parts of the fucking... Uh, of the economy that actually work very differently and in which, if there were not legal protections of the state, would not be profitable. Okay, but let's look at something like, say, like the telecoms. It's the same people, like, I, you know, the same people who are computer programmers are essentially the same people who are telecoms engineers, who are essentially the same people who are nuclear engineers. Not all well, of them that are was what managerial. I was about the, well, I, I actually don't buy the managerial thesis, but I think the, 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 the falling back of the division of labor upon itself is something that you have to look at. Because no one single part of the proletariat can assume all those functions and there aren't incentives but they, okay but they, they, but they all they already are no they don't they, they, there's no, of, you, of, like, of course they are have you ever like, worked like, in a fucking like an actual job like that you weren't the boss of yes okay <laughs> could you do all functions um, in it of, of course not but that's that's not Marx's point Marx's point is that the proletariat as a class is doing all that. Not, right, not that they, every individual yeah, but, can do sorry. everything. Right. But you're so missing in, the point. In this conversation, we're conflating kind of two theories of proletarian interests, one of which is more like historically bounded and the other of which Marx, uh, Marx at least believes, is more essential. Because we were, we're right in saying that what Marx is describing here is not just his read of the f- French peasant situation, but also contains his general class interest theory of the peasantry, right? And like a, like a lot of this idea, like the collective worker thesis that we were going to get the Kautskyan idea that we were going to get a more disciplined, more socialized proletariat that understands every facet of the machine and is ready to run every part. That I think is manifestly disproven by the trajectory of the 20th century. But that's not actually yeah. what we're looking at here. Like what we're looking at here is like... Yeah, that, that, that's, that's, that's not what Marx has said uh, at right. any point. Yeah, um, that is not, Mar- that's it, not it, Marx. It, that, that's not Marx's theory. Yeah, yeah, Marx's theory. You, you, you is, have to explain. That is, that is why the proletariat as a class has to unite because no single proletarian knows everything about how the economy well, exactly, works. Exactly. That's but, what it means to have a division of labor. And that's why the proletariat. But flip proletariat it on its head. Class. Quit like quit regarding like, Marxist piety in me and actually do some fucking objective, like oh looking at the goddamn existence in society. The reason why you don't have unified proletarian class interest is under capital as of right now. It is not clear that there actually is a unified proletarian class interest because certain parts of the proletariat can capture opportunity from other parts of it. And Marx doesn't seem to think that can happen. And yet it does. Yeah. So the the underlying theory that survives is something like what endnotes calls unity and separation, that there is a sort of like detachment from property, like, you know, literally as in like not really owning productive property and the kind of opportunity hoarding that Derek is talking about, like still basically applies to them, but it would have to go, the current incentive structures like would have to further degenerate and immiserate those that are getting those rents in order for them to feel their common class interest. And uh, like, Endnotes feels like it's such a dismal situation that 
it wouldn't even be thought of in class interest. So it'd be thought of in relationship to capital. Yeah, and right? basically local interest. Yeah, and, 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 and I think, I think Dirk, you're, you're making a, a very astute point, which is kind of the, I believe, the weakest point of, uh, of, of Marx and Engels' theory of uh, the proletariat as, as the revolutionary class, because uh, although I think the, the argument is very convincing that um, in, in general, that the, only the proletariat can be a revolutionary class because one, the proletariat is by definition, all of those who do the actual goddamn work mm -hmm. in all societies. Uh, so they already, they're already producing as a class, all of the goods and services that, that we have. So nothing will change there. And two, they don't own any private property. So uh so they have no interest in letting go of private property right, right. well I, as, as, as a general point i think that's true but i but 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 your point uh derek is i think hits at something that i think uh they kind of gloss over and um i is, think marx was well, actually how, how will you get the proletariat to uh to realize um, their interest, and their, their common interest as a class. Which um, I think is why you see late Marx and Engels worry about things like labor aristocracy, frankly. And I think that's why, even though it's incoherent yeah. and I hate it, you see the, like the PMC thesis, which is the, the ironic thing about the PMC thesis, though, is like if you really read it truly, a lot of people are actually mad at the PMC because they're being proletarianized. Like, that's weird. Mm -hmm. um, like, like you're mad at the PMC because they're being forced into some conditions like the working class. Um, then what is the working class? And why are they different? Like, I don't buy the managerial thesis entirely. What I do think, it, what I do think, it's it's both an, an illusion for, like it's 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 a distraction from, but like the way that this division of labor can be used by the bourgeois, not just to like, I mean, like if you look at the proletarianization of the society, developed world is actually like what like eighty. If you look at people dependent on the wage fund, it's like what ninety percent of the population really, like only the top CEOs and top management get paid enough out of like um, capital investments to be truly independent of wages. Um, yeah, yeah, that's 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 the division. That's the bourgeoisie, uh, right? By by definition, yeah. Right. So, like, and and that and that bourgeoisie is probably. I mean, what 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 I think confuses all this in the United States is is um it's there's all kinds of state mediations that hide these relationships too, and I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. If like Marx, Marx seems to be here realizing something he didn't necessarily realize in the in the Communist Manifesto, frankly. No, no, I, I, and 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 that's that's uh, what I was uh, going to get to as as well is um, so the Communist Manifesto was written in um, the winter of um, eighteen forty seven, published mm -hmm. in eighteen forty eight. Uh, right. right before all the revolutions of 1848. So exactly. this is what I've been reading. I've been reading the revolutions of 1848 um, um, uh, during the summer, and that's why it's kind of fresh in my mind. So from, from somewhere between 48 to 52, so right about the time when he gets to writing this, Marx and Engels sway... Um, uh, from centralization to decentralization, right. and then kind of back again, um, in in a way. So, uh, so where in the Communist Manifesto they argue for centralization of the means of production, uh, they they argue for the proletariat um, uh, taking over the the bourgeois state, uh, progressive income taxes, you know, a, a lot of stuff that. Uh, that is essentially social democrat uh, by, by by today's standards, um, like a, a, a free education of of all by the state uh, right. and so on. By by this time, um, so there's there's actually a note in the reprint in 1880 something by Engels, where Engels goes back and says, no no no, dude, we were we were fucking wrong about this. Uh, what we realized after um, uh, after uh, uh, Napoleon the Third or, or or the Brumaire was that centralization was exactly 
what made uh, Louis Napoleon gain power. Uh, and decentralization would have uh, would have kept him from uh, from doing that. So, uh, and, and we based our theory of like centralization upon this assumption, you know, that uh, it was the uh, it, it was all of these um, uh, fractured classes and so on uh, that that would make uh, the, the the dictatorship of the proletariat um, uh, impossible. But what we then realized was. Holy shit, if you have everything centralized, you have a power of the state that is so prone to abuse. Um, so what we really should do is just decentralize everything. <laughs> um, and and then they kind of swayed back and forth. But there's there's a real tension here from 48 to, to the beginning of the 1850s where they're kind of rethinking a lot of uh, what they wrote about in the Communist Manifesto, and that's kind of why why it's so why it's so interesting. Yeah, I've been studying um, this time period a lot too, uh, Emmanuel, for the same reasons, like the time period between eighteen forty eight to nineteen twenty, like that. Um, uh, partly for the pop the left project, but one of the things I've noticed is like like uh, the debates, like when you hear modern social democrats, God bless him, my friend Ben Burgess, and he is my friend, and I don't mean to like crap on him but like he will just say like Ingalls endorsed the Erfurt program and I'm like Ingalls oh, wrote man. a bunch of a, a bunch of notes telling Kowski like nationalization was a mistake and that socialization and nationalization despite what they may have said in the manifesto were not actually the same thing and mm -hmm. and like people just drop that out of the conversation almost immediately um mm -hmm. and I mean I think this does get to like one of the things I was thinking about in regards to this is like when we talk about the bourgeoisie in America, we know they exist and we know who a few of them are, but we don't really know who they are. I mean, because the bourgeoisie is almost like a formal relation because we don't have like we the are no lizards, longer, the lizards <laughs> like we know it's, no it's almost have. like it's almost like classes aren't individuals so much yeah, I know. as relations <laughs> of property. <laughs> right, right, but there is a, there's there are writers who will pick up on early Marxism's anger at individual capitalists from the what I like to like redeem like the quasi heroic period of the bourgeoisie where you had individual shop you know ownership and they could even like take one for the team as as the bourgeoisie member of a single class for a little while even though they can't do it ultimately. Like, yeah, but that's a that's a petite bourgeoisie, though. Well, 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 no, it was like in the development of the big bourgeoisie, particularly in America, that was everybody at one point. Like the steel magnets could do that mm, too. All right. Now that you have right, diffuse right, right. ownership of capital, like like the corporation really does like manifest this in a different way. Like the bourgeois, the bourgeoisie is the people who can own enough stocks. They're not the people who actually run the yeah. companies anymore. So. Um, I think Eric Owen Wright does get into this. It's hard for people to be mad at the bourgeoisie because they don't see them. A lot of people oppressing or dominating them in their lives are actually other kinds of labor aristocratic proletarian. Yeah, right. it's, it's 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 you know it's uh, almost as if class oppression is this spectral force of uh, social relations and not. Uh, not individuals, and uh, is actually an, an expression of abstract property relations that uh, is out of the control of, of, of individuals. It's, it's almost like the bourgeoisie I mean, has reified itself to the point that it doesn't even really need to exist anymore. Like oh, as a it, yeah, well, oh, wow, you you, you do you do get <laughs> new new crisis theory. Well, I'm get, new crisis I'm get, theory. I'm, <laughs> I'm getting the bong out. That's a classic. <laughs> Oh my god. It's like I this. Mean, well, yeah, that's, you know. This is how I yell at Europeans and do I, do you see this one here about the, the sack of potatoes, you know, and they're just they're, they're just lumps of potatoes in a sack that, that they've no interconnect interconnection. It's like it reminds me of like um what's that? The uh the singular this the, this idea of the singularity. I always have this like the the turnip <laughs> singularity it's like if you just get a whole load of turnips and pile them high you know that it'll just spontaneously develop like fucking uh you know awareness self-awareness like a turnip theory of self-awareness if you just connect a whole load of like computers together it'll somehow gain fucking uh some kind of uh um 
uh, intelligence. So that's like that's that, that's Marx. Marx is basically Slayton. Uh, he's basically what he's doing here is he's slating the singularity. That's my take. Is that hot enough? <laughs> is that hot enough? No, I don't think it's hot enough. <laughs> um, so you should have listened to the last episode of uh, General Intellectina and Some Side Chats. That's that's a very lukewarm take compared to what they were talking about with the, uh, <laughs> the supercomputer taking over everything. Well, I mean that's that's actually like that's that's Douglas Lane's politics. Actually, as he thinks that everything can be solved by a supercomputer figuring out the value form. But oh, um, yeah. um, <laughs> like. Like Here. I actually, I actually do think the social relations thing that way is really key because, because it also explains things like state capital. You don't need, you really can't have capitalism without capitalists. Like that's a real possibility. I know that sounds strange, but if you have a collective actor acting at acting to exploit labor, even if it's reinvesting it into itself, it's acting as if it is a capitalist, even yeah. if there's no individual capitalist involved. Right, like, the thing that's important is the social yeah, well, relation, not the, the yeah. individuals. Now, yeah, there's one it, thing. It, it, it's it's like Mark says, you know, uh, the, the capitalists are uh, are only personifications of capital. Yeah. Um, there's, there's one bit here uh, that uh, I wanted to say, but like, so this this is where he's describing about like there isn't a wealth of social relations in the peasantry. I I don't like. I, it depends what he. I don't know what he means here by social relationships, but like. Like my my parents grew up in rural Ireland in basic they were peasants you know small holding farmers who he's talking about here and they knew everybody in their village they had loads of interpersonal connections lots of friends all that type of stuff the modern proletariat like in the U S they've got fuck all interpersonal connections they don't know their neighbors they don't know anything so I think that's a very very big difference and I I think that there is like. That is something that is, uh, I think that there is capability there for a crisis theory in that like a actual atomization that way, as opposed to this peasant atomization. So, so um, uh, I, I think one thing to clarify here uh, is, so whenever Marx is translated from German into English, um, the, the, the uh, there's a there's a difference between social and societal um, that often doesn't get translated because it's apparently the same word in German. So in the Swedish translation, uh, what Marx is saying is that they have no wealth in society, like they have they have no they have no riches in 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 their standing in society. Not that they don't have social bonds or Family oh, bonds, but that makes, they, that makes a lot more have. sense. Yeah, because so the whole, every the whole... time you read, like, uh, so, so it's it's it's, uh, it's like socially necessary labor time, right? Uh, the, the word social there is societal, right? Um, uh, you know, we, we live well, in a society. <laughs> uh, right, right. Actually, I think, is, I think this is. Like honestly, I think the anti-Politico crowd, um, weird reading of Marx is based on that mistranslation. Like seriously, oh yeah, like, yeah. the way they use yeah. social like goes back and forth between societal, and then like just having social connections, and it's yeah. it, it's like because the the German is such a precise language until it's not, and when it's not, <laughs> it's really not. Like it's. Yeah. Know, like, to be clear, you, you mean our Australian friends. And not like, yeah, you know. Aussie Paul thinks that communism is the friends we made along the way. But like when we were, when I was reading this the other night, um, I kept thinking like, is, is like, is there anything at all to like the kind of Bakuninist like, or like the kind of like, uh, you know, idea of like the peasant commune becoming like the basis of like an agrarian socialism? Um, well, like even Marx thought that was possible in the Soviets in Russia. Like he says that to Vera Zerlik. Like, but yeah. he, he, it was a like it was like a runoff thing because they never, because they never encountered capital. The moment the peasant encounters capital, that form doesn't work anymore, and it becomes far more atomized. Which I think is true. I mean, like, yeah. like you think about what what is the closest thing to peasant relations in America? Because I was thinking about like the way again, me book writing. Mm -hmm. Lash, he talks about the working class in 1820, and he's referring to sharecroppers. And I realize they're not working class; they're actually non-feudal peasants. It's like the closest analogous when we actually had them. 
Um, because what do they do? They have subsistence farm and they pay in kind. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, absolutely. So like, so like sh sharecropping is like our big way of saying, well, we don't have peasants because we never had feudal relations, but we have this weird capitalist formation that pretty much fucking looked exactly like peasantry. Um, and also involved a you know ethnic ethnic and racial minority of people a lot of the time and uh, shut up. But um, I think it's interesting because that's part of the obscured relations in America. And as far as like understanding our own history and our development towards capitalism, um, but it's it's also interesting in that uh, we don't like like when we talk about peasantry, we're also talking about a lot of areas like in Ireland are like, like when I talk about peasants, when I go to talk to, talk to like real peasants and like indigenous areas in like Southern Mexico and Guatemala. All right. You know, and I've been there and, but th that's a place where capitalist capitalist um, relations barely exist. And it exists in like a corner store. Like, and it is, whereas you think about like, the sharecroppers in a capitalist society, they are pretty damn isolated. And I guess, I guess so what are these small peasants would have been. So like, I think, I think like the village small town life. Yeah. But like the no social wealth does actually translate to like, not a lot of connections outside of the small area. Um, yeah. They might know everybody in the area, but they don't have any way to really mobilize it. They, they can't, they don't have, you know, what, what a normal sociologist would sell. Um, yeah, so they are different in in yeah, German. Yeah, yeah. But I, I was just gonna shout out to 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 uh, Jara. So, sozial and uh, gesellschaftlich. Mm -hmm. Is that um, yeah. have different meanings? Social and societal, respectively. Yeah. So, so, um, but uh, and that may very well be the case. I've just noticed a lot of times in the English translation, the word is social. And in the Swedish translation, it is societal. And I just can't believe that's a coincidence because it, a, lot of, a lot of times it makes one of those terms make a lot more sense than the other. <laughs> yeah, I was actually thinking um, about that too because, like I said, I was thinking about the anti poll and I know Gesellschaftsdienst is the word they're translating in the social. Um, and the one quote they always cite against politics. No, uh, it, isn't uh, Gesellschaft um, society? In, in yeah. Germany? So Gesellschaft. Could so, be societal. Yeah, Aussie Paul is mis is uh, rolling with a mis, mis with a mistranslation. Mistranslation. That's what basically. I'm saying. Like I've I've suspected that. And based in their whole viewpoint, their whole Marxism viewpoint off off of I that thought, mistranslation. Okay. Although to be to be uh, fa quote fair to the Australian school, the um, Baudrillard makes the point in the Divine Left that there's always this kind of like reification of the social that runs through Stalinism and like all all forms of you know what we would call 20th century like socialism and uh, it's a very conservative strand that's sort of lurking inside of um socialism i have no idea what any of that <laughs> uh it, it is or 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 uh or what it means but it sounds cool uh french brain uh, uh australian what was that australian no no the Aust theory? okay you, you remember like uh, let's not go there yeah, yeah, yeah all right all right this question of, of how specifically uh, this isolation manifests itself in the proletariat is interesting to me. I'd like to, to talk about it more in the future, but uh, not right now. Which is why cybernetics is our salvation. Let us move on. <laughs> Save us, giant computer god. Yeah. Save us. Save us unity. Your only hope. Um, <laughs> Just the uh, the quip about, hence the low fear, spirited despair, the feeling of monstrous humiliation and degradation that oppresses the breast of France and makes her gasp. She feels dishonored. Uh, is the national mood of the libs mood in, in uh, the oh. U.S. for sure? Yeah, it really no, is. Oh, it. It yeah, really it is. is. It is. They, it is. I mean, the libs need to grasp more breasts. Is what I say. <laughs> But I mean, it, 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 it is, it is very much a, a like, how dare you make all our shit obvious? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <gasps> My word. Yeah. It's like, it's, a, it's very pearl clutching. So isn't it? it's the wizard of Oz moment, isn't it? Yeah. There he is. Yeah. There's a wizard. He's a little shit yeah. guy. Fuck this. Yeah. Let's kill him. And he's wasted on whiskey and full chomp full of sausages. 
yeah, touching up the girls, you know, the the, the children, no doubt. The, so is, yeah, so is the opposition. So oh, like, okay, Tom is going over to the QAnon verse uh, <laughs> apparently. Uh, yeah. To be fair, first. both both of our leading candidates are kind of you know our, t- our touchy, curves. touchy. Yeah. Let's oh yeah, honest. absolutely. Yeah. No. So so yeah. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. The artwork for the show was created by the Korean artist and author of the 2019 Marx Engels illustration book. You can check out links to his work and Twitter account in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollars.